From New York City to our viewers worldwide, Romain Bostic in for Jonathan Farrell. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, the U.S. economy improving, jobs growth accelerating, the pace though remaining below expectations, payrolls missing for a second straight month. With investors looking ahead to fresh Treasury auctions and inflation data coming next week. But we begin with the big issue here, and of course it is that payrolls report providing more fuel for that transitory debate. The wage element of the, the jobs report. That's the really important news out of this report. Look at, you know, what's happening to average hourly earnings. So far, we, we hadn't seen as much wage inflation. The push up in wages will fuel and continue the debate on whether transitory becomes more permanent. Inflation is definitely back. There's a supply dynamic that is difficult. The question now in the coming months is going to be how transitory that is. The Fed is clearly shifting their communication. Starting to talk about talking about uh, tapering. The whole tapering discussion is, is certainly coming to the forefront. The punch is actually spilling over the sides. Still a wash with excess liquidity. The Fed is just putting so much liquidity into the system. When QE ends, that'll take some of the rate pressure off. Taper's just not scary. That should be priced in. I don't think there's a lot of ambiguity. All right, 559,000 jobs created. Of course, that's less than expected, but well above what we saw in the previous month. Sabaja Rajapal Sakjen joining us right now, along with Jim Karen, Morgan Stanley, and Asis Shah of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Sabaja, a lot of talk right now about what the Fed will or won't do. Does today's report change the dynamic? Well, I think it's, it's pretty much baked in the expectations that the Fed will start talking about tapering asset purchases or, dis, or the, these are discussions will begin at the next meeting. So this is very much, this employment number, uh, you know, puts them very much on track to do that because what they're looking for is steady gains in the employment uh, picture. Uh, yes, the expectation was for perhaps a, a million jobs uh, you know, per month to be created, but 500,000 on average for uh, all of 2021 is not that bad. And there's just, you know, like, uh, you know, in the introduction, there's just a lot of cash out there. You know, there's not really, um, you know, much evidence that more asset purchases is going to do anything for the economy. So I think it's a good time for the Fed to start thinking about tapering asset purchases. Well, I guess then the question becomes, does the market believe that, Jim? I mean, you have this shortfall in payrolls. You have these inflationary pressures that may or may not be temporary. Do you think the market right now believes that the Fed will hold the line or will move sooner than expected? Oh, I, I think the market believes that the Fed is going to be somewhat patient. They'll probably start talking about tapering perhaps at the Jackson Hole Symposium, which is in late August, maybe announce it in September. The real issue here, as was mentioned earlier, is it's really about wages. So what the Fed needs, the real conundrum for the Fed, is that the Fed needs a lot of people to come into the labor market in order to remain patient and keep yields low. Now, let me explain that because it sounds like it's very, very contradictory in terms of what I just said. The whole point here is that the more people stay out of the labor force, the less supply of labor there is. That means that wage pressures start to move higher, and that increases inflation expectations, and that makes the Fed's job a little bit harder. The more people that come in, wage pressures start to get more normalized and start to fall a bit, and that keeps inflation expectations and inflation pressures a bit lower. So what the Fed really needs to see is that 7.6 million people who are still on the sidelines relative to pre-pandemic levels versus where we are today start to re-enter the labor market. And once they start to re-enter, we think that these wage pressures normalize and that these inflation risks start to dissipate. And that allows the Fed to be patient and go along their normal course of action w within their own timeline. Asish, your initial thoughts here on the jobs report today. Look, this was a Goldilocks number. Um, I think this is a number that allows you as an investor and encourages you as an investor to take that beach vacation you know, pay probably a steeper price for the cocktail and enjoy your summer of generating returns, generating carry, not worry about your investments because this game is basically not going to be up this summer. Um, we can kind of kick the concerns of taper and taper tantrum and inflation to until September, or October, when we get the new data points. And I, I think that this this data point of rising wages, but really 
not accelerating job growth um, tells us that the Fed has the plan and you know we can they can be patient and they're frankly getting what they want, which is wages to rise and to broaden the base of this recovery. There are also some supply side issues, I think, that the economy and, of course, the Fed uh, is going to have to address. We spoke with uh, Jeff Rosenberg uh, over at BlackRock a little bit earlier about this. Take a listen at what he had to say. The news here on this payroll report is that you're seeing signs of the supply side constraints to the labor market. And you're seeing, so you're seeing that in some of the headline numbers, you're seeing that in some of the industry numbers. It is a similar story to what we saw in April in that average hourly earnings figure before. So for a long time, we've ignored these figures because they've been very distorted by the mix shift. The fact that you're seeing the increases in spite of the mix shift is really going to feed into this narrative of supply side constraints pushing up wages. Jeff Rosenberg there of BlackRock Asish. When we talk about this report and we talk about a lot of the other data points that we've gotten over the past week, there seems to be a little bit of asymmetry here, I guess, between what expectations are and what the reality on the ground is. You have inflation. Inflation, I guess, whether it's transitory or not, if you have that with a strengthening job market, it's not necessarily so bad. But if you have it with a weak job market, that has to be some cause for concern. Look, I, I, I think that um, we're in this period of time when we know all the data is tainted in one form or another. We know the whole economy isn't open. We know that there's distortions coming from uh, federal policy and the way people are incentivized to work, whether they can work or not, based on child care. And I, I think that you know this is a number that's telling you that there isn't such a push of growth that you're going to create inflation that isn't going to dissipate as people roll back into the workforce when they actually have to work and are incentivized to work, which is going to happen this fall. So, you know, from my perspective as an investor, um, I, it really kind of makes me feel good that we're not seeing this massive impulse of demand um, facing a lack of supply uh, and, and supply constraints, that rather the economy is actually moderating itself until supply is available. And you know, when you're making investment decisions, it's not about what you're seeing this month or next month. It's mm -hmm. really about thinking about how's the economy and how's inflation, monetary policy going to evolve over the next three to four years. And in my mind, you know, what we just heard is we can kind of wait. Uh, and, and like I said, in, enjoy the summer and w yeah. start worrying about the path yeah. as we hit the fall. Well, Jim, let's talk about the summer. A lot of people are looking ahead, of course, to Jackson Hole in August and potentially, I guess, some sort of formal policy discussion amongst the FOMC members at their first meeting in September after the summer is over. What are you generally expecting? Well, I, I expect that some white papers are going to be floated around that's going to talk about tapering um, and probably gets enacted at the September FOMC, but actual tapering doesn't actually take place either until late this year or early next year. You know, but, but one of the things that I think the Fed has to start to think about, and you know, I know we were talking about wages, but the Atlanta Fed had a very interesting study that came out, and they said that most of the wage pressures, upward rate, wage pressures, are coming from the lower demographics of wage earners. That the medium and higher demographic of wage earners, they're not experiencing as much wage inflation. So, you know, this is really what you know Ashish was, you know, discussing and, and talking about where as more people do come into the labor market, it is going to probably make the inflation pressures look a bit more transitory, and it's going to allow the Fed to be a bit more patient and, and move along the timeline that they'd like. So we don't see this necessarily as a as a destructive influence on the markets right now. You know, I think the bond markets, actually, if you look at where 10-year Treasury yields are, are looking right through this. This isn't anything exciting for the, you know, for the for the 10-year Treasury. So and even break-evens are, are starting to show that inflation is starting to come down a little bit. So all of this is you know, I hate to use the word Goldilocks, but it does make it seem like we're going to be in a lower rate environment yeah. without any real catalyst that might, you know, change, you know, change that.
All right, well, you're the second person on this show uh, to use that word. Jim Karen, fixed income portfolio manager over at Morgan Stanley, Aziz Shah, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, and Sabaja Rajapas Sakjin, head of global rate strategy. Everyone sticking with us as we take a quick break here. But up next, the riskiest part of the high yield bond market that's topping the tape, extending its rally a ninth consecutive session. That conversation and more coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. I'm Romain Bostic in for Jonathan Farrell today. Time now for the auction block where we kick things off over in Europe with signs of fragility emerging in sovereign debt markets. Germany's five-year bond sale seeing the weakest demand since April of 2020. And in the U.S., Citigroup headlining a host of financial institutions in high-grade debt sales, helping boost issuance to almost $20 billion, meeting weekly estimates and U.S. junk bonds coming off a record month. Pricing another $5 billion this week, led by an offering from Bombardier, Sabaja Rajapa, Jim Karen, Asis Shah still with us here around the table as we talk a little bit more about what to expect next week. Sabaja, let's start off in Europe. You got the European Commission holding an investor call next week, trying to get us, uh, gauge, I guess, maybe the appetite here for some of the debt issuance that the market seems to be expecting. What are you expecting out of Europe? Well, in recent auctions, surprisingly, we've seen some pressure in, in bonds in, in Europe. I mean, our expectation broadly is that bond yields will, will get pretty close to zero or, or even higher by the end of the year. So you are starting to see the same dynamics that you're seeing in the U.S. around auctions, where you see sort of weaker uh, auctions and sort of weaker setup, I should say, going heading into auctions. I think that sort of dynamic is, is here to stay. And the fact that, you know, yields in the U.S. have risen, uh, you know, quite meaningfully, there's a lot of catch up from, from global bond yields. So... I think that that sort of dynamic is is, is very much in in play, but again, you know, when bond yields start getting closer to to zero, I think you're going to see that same sort of, sort of stalling you're seeing in the in the uh, in the U.S. Treasury market where ten year yields got to 175 and things started uh, you know stalling a little bit. So I think that there's still more room for bond yields to rise, but we'll have to see how uh, the market takes down the supply going forward. Asish, uh, another thing a lot of folks are looking at next week, of course, is uh, anticipation of the Fed beginning to unwind uh, some of those uh, ETF purchase purchases in the corporate bond space, uh, particularly with some of those investment-grade ETFs. What are you generally expecting about how the market's going to receive uh, that amount coming back onto the market? I think there's going to be a food fight to buy those bonds. There's a total shortage of quality paper, especially in the front end of the curve. And... This, the Fed's holdings are tiny in the context of the amount of demand there is for high quality paper in general. So I, I would expect it's going to be a total non-event. Um, make sure you you know dial ahead, you know, uh, and and look to place your bids if you need the paper because it's going to be tough to get. And then you, when you look, uh, see, uh, just to follow up on that, when you look at sort of just the investment grade market uh, overall, even in the absence of what the Fed's about to put back out there. We had seen a little bit of a pullback, I guess, over the past few weeks, at least relative to some of the uh, frenzy that we saw at the start of the year here. What's the general appetite right now for some of that U.S. investment grade debt, particularly at the lower end of the investment grade scale? Yeah, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of demand, um, particularly in the mid curve where uh, spread curves are very steep. I think part of what's driving this, um, you know, anyone that's been sitting in cash the last two months has been suffering and really missing out on returns. And um, if you've been in higher quality kind of instruments that are liquid, like agency mortgages, you're finding that you're at super tight spreads um, relative to what you're used to. And so all of this, um, along with, at times, negative rates on on things like treasury instruments is leading people to move out marginally on the risk curve for their cash and cash equivalents. And so in, in my mind, this is all creating demand in the IG space. It's a space where we know fundamentals are going to be fine. We know liquidity is going to be totally fine over the course of the next couple of years, given the amount of reserves that the Fed has created. And so why not take the carry while you can? Um, and, and that's yeah. exactly what we're seeing investors do. So we are seeing a shortage yeah. of bonds, 
which is why I think you have to go get them while, when, they're, when they're out there and available. Jim, when we talk about the risk appetite in this market, a lot of people uh, will really focus in on the high yield market uh, and some of the gains that we saw a little bit earlier in the year, gains that have seemed to have faded as we got uh, into April and through May and now here at the start of June here. Uh, is there anything that we can read from some of the activity in the high yield market about some of the broader market sentiment and more importantly, I guess, about the direction of this economy? Yeah, I think the high yield market is reflecting more of a cyclical recovery just like it is in the equity markets. So if we think about what's been doing well in the high yield market, it's been the less interest rate sensitive segments. So it's been the triple C's and the single B's. You know, you can look at areas like cable and satellite, packaging, um, energy, miners. You know, a, a lot of these are, are going to be somewhat cyclical in nature. But, you know, effectively, what we have to also understand is that the key source of volatility for credit markets this year was the sudden rise in interest rates. If we're not going to have another surge higher in rates, then effectively that component of the volatility falls away. So then what we're looking at is economic growth, GDP, which really represents cash flow to corporations. So if we look at the cash flow and compare that to default risks, and default risks are low and, and all markets are very fully valued these days. But the point here is that if the source of volatility, which is the movement towards higher rates, it's not economic volatility because we expect the data to be good and the Fed to remain supportive. So if the key source of volatility, which is interest rates, falls away, then if I look at carry per unit of duration risk, or if I look at carry or income per unit of, of volatility, some of the lower segments of the markets, uh, quality segments of the of the high yield markets look good. So, so this is an area you know that we're looking at, and I think you have to be very selective. I, I don't think you can make this statement just very broadly across any company, but generally speaking, that's where I think uh, people are going to look to earn some incomes, particularly if we enter into a very long range bound extended market. Sabadra, any thoughts here uh, about what we're seeing in the market right now? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with, uh, with Jim. I think that when interest rates are low and expected to remain low, and look at the price action today after, uh, after the, uh, the payrolls report was we saw a decline, if anything, in, in rate volatility, and people started coming in and buying the belly of the curve, even in treasuries to pick up carry. So if that is the case and people are willing to come in and buy treasuries around 160 uh, in 10 years, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't go uh, out into the risk spectrum and, uh, you know, perhaps into higher yielding assets in search of higher returns. So that sort of dynamic, I think, is, gonna, is, is here to stay if 10 yields remain in a range for the summer. All right, Subhadra Rajapa, uh, of course, uh, Jim Karen, Asish Shah, of course, all-star lineup here. This is basically your top three fantasy picks. They're all sticking with us. Going to take a quick break, but still ahead, that final spread, the week ahead, inflation data, and, of course, that ECB rate decision, that conversation. Coming up next, this is Bloomberg. You are watching Bloomberg Real Yield. And no, I'm not Jonathan Farrell, Romain Bostic in for Jonathan this week. Time now for that final spread. Coming up in the week ahead on Monday, we get German factory orders. On Tuesday, it's that Eurozone GDP. Wednesday, the U.S. auctioning off $38 billion of 10-year notes, plus the Bank of Canada out with that rate decision. On Thursday, another rate decision, this time from the ECB. Plus, we're going to get the U.S. CPI numbers. And on Friday, the G7 Leaders Summit kicking off in England. Still with us here, Sabaja Rajapa, Jim Caron, and Asis Shah. Jim, let's start off with that G7 meeting. Are you expecting uh, anything meaningful to come out of this, particularly with some of the talk now about some sort of potential tax floor? Yeah, I, I know taxes are, are front and center right now. I, I don't know... Um, if this meeting is going to give us a, a full solution on, on what that's going to be. I do think that it is interesting that people are talking along these lines. This is something that's good to see, you know, when the G7 gets together, that they can have a productive discussion and, and discuss such things. But overall, I, I, I don't really see this as a, as a market moving event. Asish, as we look towards next week, we also have, of course, that ECB meeting. Uh, obviously, no one's really expecting any sort of meaningful change in policy. But with regards to the messaging uh, that we're getting out of the ECB here, how do you think it will either be similar or differ from what we've been hearing from the U.S. Fed? Look, I, 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 obviously, Europe is in a slightly different spot. It's earlier in process of recovery. 
Um, so, so I think that there's still the need to be very supportive. And I think that the thing that the ECB is very conscious of is, is the fact that, you know, if rates do start to rise, you can very quickly start questioning the ability for uh, de debt sustainability and some of the, uh, the member components of the um, EU. And so I think they have to thread that needle. I think they'll be very um, careful to be supportive and yet set the stage for the longer term path that they, they want to continue to follow. But a lot of the focus is about making sure that they, they, they definitely kind of are supportive because again, the inflation picture, the fiscal picture, um, and the, the stage of recovery is far different in the EU relative to the US. And when you look at those differences, Subhadra, and I guess what now is starting to see differences in the way various central banks uh, are responding to uh, not only the economic crisis, but still to a certain uh, degree, the COVID crisis itself, is it okay that we don't necessarily have a complete synchronization uh, in financial in uh, monetary policy? No, I think that that's inevitable, right? Because these economies are growing at very, very different uh, speeds. Uh, Europe is definitely lagging uh, the U.S. in a big way because the, their vaccination deployment was very uh, delayed relative to the U.S. So I think that it, the sequencing actually makes sense. You know, we've already seen the Bank of Canada. Uh, you know, get ahead and start tapering asset purchases. I think it's going to be the U.S.'s turn next and then the ECB. But to me, I mean, next week, and I think you sort of uh, skipped this point, is that the real key data point for me next week is going to be core CPI that comes out. I mean, we're, I mean, the consensus is for 0.4 pickup in, in, in core CPI and for the year-over-year -year number to get as high as 3.4%. So I think any upside surprises there is going to dominate any of the other uh, news uh, you know, headlines that you've mentioned thus far. So we'll be watching that. We'll be watching to see what the ECB says. But I think uh, CPI might steal the headlines. And the persistence, though, of that gain, obviously that's a bit of a deceleration from the 0.8% that we saw the previous month. But when you take that 0.4%, are you going to sort of extrapolate that out to June, July, August, and beyond? Um, I think it's probably unlikely that you see consistent uh, numbers like that, but then you're going to have at least a couple of months of base effects coming from lower prints last year. So we have to get through till the middle of the year and beyond to get past at least the base effect distortions to see how sustainable this rise in inflation is. And that's really the key because we're not really, we don't really have a clear picture on yeah. how long this transient, uh, how long inflation is going to be yeah. transient. Sabadra, always a pleasure. Sabadra, Rajapa, Jim, Karen, have a great weekend. And see Shah, you too as well. And of course, to our viewers in New York and worldwide, have a wonderful weekend. This was Bloomberg Real Yield. You are watching Bloomberg.